I'd like to talk in this third of the talk about the early days of RSA and what we thought we were doing, the history of its invention, and some of the lessons that we, we learned as we went along the way. The importance of solving real world problems I think is real important. I'd like to talk, begin by talking about that. Using computer science theory and number theory, Len has emphasized the importance of those two disciplines as, as background for what we, what we did. I'd like to talk about the importance of being optimistic and attempting to do the impossible. Talk specifically about the invention of RSA. And then talk about the importance of Moore's law to cryptography. It's really been a, a key feature with public key cryptography. And the importance of doing cryptography in public, which resonates with Lynn's final remarks. Uh, the importance of cryptographic theory, and then the importance of organizations in research. Trying to solve real world problems uh, was at the heart of what we thought we were doing to begin with. We were stimulated by Diffie and Hellman's seminal paper, New Directions in Cryptography, where they said, we stand today at the brink of a revolution in cryptography, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I ever saw one, they, they uh, really started the whole field of public research in cryptography to a great extent. They proposed the idea of a public key crypto system, developed jointly with Ralph Merkel, and introduced what for me was the most exciting and, and stimulating uh, concept of all, the notion of a digital signature. The idea that someone could create a digital signature that anybody could verify but nobody could forge was a, was a stunning idea to me and really a highly motivating one. And I think that uh, that application uh, is, is representative of what's happened since in cryptography. Much good cryptography is motivated by applications, thinking about the real world, thinking about how to carry our real world life into the electronic world, trying to see how to map these things over securely. E-commerce, mental poker, voting, other auctions, uh, things like this are all part of the, the game. And it's, it's been a rich field because of the drive from the application side. As Len said, in 76, algorithms and complexity theory were, were just beginning. Cryptography is a consumer of these areas. It needs easy problems for the good guys, like multiplication or prime finding. It needs hard problems to make the adversary's task impossible. So we were drawing on these fields, as Len indicated, to try to formulate really the first realization of a public key crypto system, first public realization. We were also drawing upon number theory. Uh, Diffie and Hellman had already used number theory in their paper for key agreement. Two parties can agree upon a secret key using modular exponentiation. And the more we looked for a public key crypto system, the more we saw that algebraic structure of some sort was needed. And we kept returning to the, this vast deep well of number theory and its beautiful results and the complexity theory results that Len alluded to already that were starting to appear. The difficulty of factoring was, was beginning to be known. As Len said, it was not polynomial time. We weren't sure how hard it was, but it seemed like a good thing to bring to the table. And that's really one of our key contributions is bringing factoring to the, to the table. On the point of doing the impossible, Diffie Hellman left as an open problem with the question of realizing a public key crypto system. Can you find two functions, E and D, that are mutually inverse, where E can be made public without revealing how D should operate. We struggled with this and, and at times thought it was impossible. If we spent time uh, trying to prove it was impossible, uh, we failed at that. But uh, ever since we've, we've seen more and more examples where something that seems intrinsically contradictory can in fact be solved. And so I'd, I'd like to propose this meta theorem of cryptography that any apparently contradictory set of requirements can in fact be met with the right mathematical approach. It's, it's been uh, surprising to me often this holds. Uh, you see, see a set of requirements which just look like they, they go like this, yet with, with a, the right insight and the right mathematics, uh, you can put it together. We tried and discarded lots of approaches. Uh, some of them were knapsack type approaches. And uh, Len was particularly adept at uh, killing off some of the suggestions that Adi and I made. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Uh, Groups of an unknown size seem like an interesting notion. Uh, the idea of permutation polynomials. We played with lots of different variations on themes. Uh, finally, after a Seder one night at, at one of the students' house, Ani Bruce's house, uh, I was sitting in the apartment and, and the ideas that we were playing with sort of fell into place. And the RSA system, as, as currently known, was, was uh, first envisioned. It uses, as we, as we know now, the product of two large primes to form a modulus n. Encryption is the raising to the eth power 
mod n, decryption is raising to some other power d mod n. So the public key is e and n, the private key is d and n. And the difficulty of factoring protects uh, one from, protect, keeps the adversary from discovering the secret key. So we didn't know at the time how hard or how secure this was. It seemed like a plausible scheme, but we'd seen so many schemes bite the dust already that this seemed like another one that uh, you know, Len might uh, in the morning look at and say, sorry, Ron, you know, this, this wasn't gonna work either. But uh, the more we looked at it, the, the, the more it stood up. And uh, we looked around for people who had assessed the difficulty of factoring and, and might be able to, to uh, advise us on the security of the scheme in addition to our own uh, assessment. Martin Gardner heard about it and became interested in it, wrote a column in August of 1977 describing the scheme. So it was really the first publication of the RSA scheme and included as an example that he'd requested a 129 digit number N that we'd produced, a product of two crimes, for which we offered $100 uh, to anyone who could factor that number or decode the associated message that we encrypted using RSA. We estimated somehow or other that this would take 40 quadrillion years to, to break. <laughs> Our notes on that process of estimation are lost at this point. The same article uh, offered to readers uh, the ability to send in a self-addressed stamped envelope and get a copy of our tech memo, which was published uh, early in the year. This is the one on the left here, the yellow one. And after resolving some issues about the export law, which we'd never heard of before, uh, finally we threw a party for graduate students to consume large amounts of pizza and mail all of these out. We mailed out about 4,000 of them. And ACM published our article uh, early the next year. Uh, this generated a lot of publicity. We were quite surprised at the amount of publicity. Time Magazine wrote an article in 1978, uh, included this photo of the three of us. Uh, the, uh, very few people noticed the little joke we put on the blackboard uh, at the time. <laughs> which, which, uh, which is good. But uh, therefore P equals NP was, was, was hidden on the blackboard. The group that we ended up working with ZN star, multiplicative group mod N, turns out to be a wonderful group for all kinds of purposes. and It's been used many times since. Uh, factoring makes it hard for an adversary to determine the size of this group or to compute discrete logs uh, in this group. The uh, difficulty of breaking RSA though isn't quite the same as factoring or computing discrete logs. Um, it's really taking ETH roots mod N. And so this has become a separate complexity theoretic assumption standing on its own right different than factoring, the difficulty of factoring. It's become known as the RSA assumption. And as, as the field has progressed, in fact, there have been extensions of this. The strong RSA assumption is now in, in frequent use, uh, where it's assumed that the taking of ETH roots mod n is hard, where the adversary can even pick the exponent e as some integer larger than one. So that was the invention of RSA. And then, and then we sat back and tried to see, is, is this really a practical scheme? And when we sat down and programmed it on our workstations, the one MIPS VAX at the time, it was very slow. It took about 30 seconds to do an RSA operation. Uh, really too slow for practical use. And finding crimes, you wouldn't want to hear about it. I mean, that was really, really slow. The IBM PC came around soon thereafter, but it wasn't much faster. So we looked at hardware implementations of RSA. We looked at special purpose boards. We built a, a uh, and then for Adi, Len, and I to get involved in hardware design. That was quite an interesting uh, venture in itself. But we did that. We also looked at uh, special purpose VLSI uh, chips and, and designed one of those, which uh, computed RSA in under a second. And we did this to, in part to demonstrate, it was an interesting experience for us to learn about these technologies and also to prove the practicality of RSA. Today, Moore's Law has come to the rescue. Software now runs thousands of times faster and nobody puts much uh, work into special purpose hardware for these kinds of things. You can do it just great with software. Software really rules and the web, which has been enabled by, the, by Moore's law, uh, is, provides the primary motivation for a lot of the real cryptography that happens in practice. Here's a photo of the RSA chip. It never quite worked right. There were some electrical induction problems that uh, kept it from working, but the design we were quite proud of nonetheless. I think it's important to do research in public and cryptography has emerged from a field where a lot of research was happening privately, a lot of good research, I'm sure, although we never saw it, 
but uh, to a field where a lot of research is now being done in public. The field of cryptography has blossomed, uh, and for many good reasons. Um, I think that to establish confidence in the cryptography you're using, one really needs to uh, have widespread, intensive public review. And uh, RSA has certainly received that over the years. The newly adopted AES is a similar scheme that's gotten intensive public review. That's a really requirement these days for uh, trust in a cryptographic scheme. In addition, uh, cryptography means communication. Communication really means interoperability. One needs public standards to make crypto work. And so public standards are, again, a requirement. Uh, and doing cryptography in public is necessary to do, get public standards. But this seed that Diffie and Hellman planted has really blossomed over the years in a wonderful way. And now there's a, a huge number of conferences and papers and, and different public key schemes that have been proposed. Um, it's, it's really a vigorous area of research, as it should be. Many others proposed uh, public key crypto schemes. Um, Merkel and Hellman proposed some based on knapsacks that unfortunately fell apart. Uh, Michael Rabin Williams proposed some similar to RSA, but more closely tied to factoring, the difficulty of factoring. Shafi Goldwasser and Sylvia McCauley proposed an interesting probabilistic scheme based on the difficulty of quadratic res residuosity. Uh, Al Gamal proposed a scheme also randomized, tied to the discrete logarithm problem. Uh, moving away from number theoretic based schemes or simple number theoretic based schemes, Miller and Koblitz have proposed uh, interesting schemes based on the use of groups uh, formed with elliptic curves, and those have uh, found a bit of, quite a bit of use recently. Uh, Kramer and Shoup uh, have, have looked at schemes that uh, are secure against chosen ciphertext attack, and so on. There's just hundreds, literally, of schemes of interesting properties. The field has, has, has blossomed in a wonderful way, and there's no way to list them all here, but, but I just wanted to mention a few, uh, few highlights. Well, in 1994, um, this $100 challenge that we put out was, was, uh, was met. Uh, thousands of computers uh, using the quadratic SIV algorithm were, were harnessed together to factor RSA 129 as that number became known. And the secret message was decoded. Uh, the magic words are squeamish, squeamish asapraj, which were two random words we, we picked out of a dictionary. We didn't want to have the message guessable. So we paid off on the $100. And uh, <laughs> this is probably the cheapest purchase of computing time ever. <laughs> Um, and the field of factoring has certainly matured hugely over, over the years since then. Uh, the, the rather rough and inaccurate estimates that we made are certainly much refined. The, the, the uh, difficulty that these guys faced was pretty well estimated before they started the task. Um, and even so, the, the difficulty that they, they faced, they, they, the work they had to put into it, uh, gives credibility to the fact that factoring still seems to be a hard problem and it helps to establish in a precise way that the key size is needed for security. I'd like to mention some of the factoring milestones. Uh, in 1984, Gus Simmons and colleagues at uh, Sandia uh, were covered by a Time Magazine article for their work involved factoring a 69-digit number. And by 1991, the state of the art using Pomerantz's quadratic sieve algorithm had moved up to 100 decimal digits. And in 94, as I indicated, our 129 digit, decimal digit number had been uh, factored using a distributed version of the quadratic sieve algorithm. In 1999, a 155 digit number, or a 512 bit number, was factored using the new algorithm, the number field sieve, which uh, is, is a big step forward algorithmically, although it's still not a polynomial time algorithm. And in the year 2001, the number 15 was factored <laughs> in a very interesting way. Uh, a, a computer built at IBM based on the principles of quantum mechanics uh, factored this number using Shor's algorithm. And if RSA is to fall someday, it may be because of extensions of these ideas, if one can really build large-scale quantum computers. Many other attacks on RSA have been proposed over the years, cycling attacks, uh, repeat encryption, attacks based on weak keys. These all seem to be closely related to factoring. Attacks based on lack of randomization or improper padding. Uh, these are fixed typically by applications of ideas to the Bolaric Rogaways, OAAP, or similar ideas. Uh, timing analysis, power analysis, fault analysis. There's many different ways a crypto system can fall apart, and, and a lot of them have to do with implementation. 
Uh, and so we want us to be careful in the implementation. These are things we've learned. Dan Bullner wrote a wonderful survey of attacks on the RSA, RSA crypto system that I can recommend to you for a detailed history of these. As one looked at all these schemes, crypto theory kept developing. And crypto theory, I think, really is important for, for the field. In some fields, the practice and the theory diverge. Cryptography is a wonderful field where theory and practice, if anything, converge that the theory is inspired by new problems, new applications, and enriches uh, the practice conversely. So it, it, it's uh, a field where theory and practice uh, are, are twins that are tied together in a nice way. Theory of probabilistic encryption, security against chosen cipher attacks, a theory of digital signatures, theory of zero knowledge protocols, theory of practice oriented provable security, a whole range of notions have been developed and are wonderful theoretical constructs and very relevant to practice. And so the, uh, the synergy, synergy between theory and practice in crypto is just, it's just fun to watch. Finally, I'd like to close by, by noting that organizations are important for research too. Um, ACM, I'd like to thank ACM again for the, for the sponsor of the Turing Award, of course. Uh, CACM, run by the ACM, published the RSA paper back in 1978. And, uh, their sponsorship of many research-oriented activities is just, it's just wonderful. David Chaum was one of the key founders of the International Association for Cryptologic Research, which ran the crypto conferences uh, starting in 1981, meeting at uh, UC Santa Barbara every year. And uh, that has proved a forum for those papers that didn't make it into stock or whatever, uh, for, for many of the uh, crypto papers. And RSA, the company, uh, sponsors conferences as well. Uh, was a leader in many of the crypto policy debates uh, when the government tried to suppress various forms of cryptography and helped to set crypto standards such as the PKS standards.